but they're doing it much more repetitively. So their rates should be higher, they're not. This one scares me, this is what we're gonna talk about a lot today. You anonymously survey bags. The six month period, almost 50% will have sustained an injury that they never reported. Think that number's low? Absolutely. We get hurt a lot more than we actually tell the employer. And that's one of the things that we've got to really think about is, do we as medics have a tool? Do we have something we can do if we have that little tweak? Well, we can stretch. Compliance there is historically poor. We can exercise, not a lot of time for that, but we could. What else can we do? So let's talk about posture, because I gotta explain to you guys really why injury occurs in EMS. I want you to think about this differently. You're gonna, when you leave here today, I promise you one thing, the two postures I'm about to go through, you will see it in every single one of your employees today. You'll see it when you go to the airport to go home. If you're walking to the airport and go, ooh, he's got a lower cross syndrome. And why it's so important to why injury occurs in EMS. So as we know, we drop a plumb line down from the ceiling. That's a neutral spine. The position of the body that is the most biomechanically advantageous. The least amount of load, the least amount of strain in the spine and the joints. So that plumb line should contact lateral, lateral malleolus, center the knee. one is what we refer to as an upper crossed pattern. Now these two patterns are a cause and effect. Because we do something, there is the effect that occurs in the body. So with an upper cross, the best way we can describe an upper cross pattern probably gonna struggle getting one of these chairs. So if you think about it, let's keep it real. When you're a little kid, you go to school, you sit in a chair about this big, right? Look it up with the TV. And if you're older, you do the same little book. And you sat there and you turned pages and you had a pencil and you wrote it. Mm-hmm. Those of you that are younger, you type, you flip on tablets, you plug in your phone. So we spend the beginning years of our lives kind of stuck down here. And then you go to school, you pretty much stay in this position again. Then you get your driver's license, so you're cool. Drop like this. Now you're a medic, still drive like this. And where are your patients when you show up? Well, they're on the floor. Why can't they have a good in chair? So you treat them down here. Then you take them to the hospital, sitting like this, working down here. Then you go to the hospital, and then you have to type your report. And then you drive back to the station. And have me always tell a medic in the room. <laughs> so, is it safe to assume we've been stuck in an upper cross pattern our entire life? Since day one, basically. We live in this very rounded position. What happens is this the muscles in the front of the body, the scalenes, your deep neck flexors, Expect minor in particular, and the internal rotators of the shoulders become what's called short and tight. They pull forward. Where do we feel the, the symptom from that? No posterior. Headaches, neck pain, popping, clicking in the jaw, rotator cuff strains, sprains in the upper back. Mostly because of a distortion in how we work. We commonly see, especially when we work with our tactical guys, very fit, very strong, very intimidating officers, firefighters, and medics. There are a few medics out there that are fit and intimidating that have a rash of injuries. Because although they're very strong, they're very imbalanced. That's the way to see it is to look at external rotation. The most important movement you can have in the shoulder is external rotation. So we can have external rotation here, we can have external rotation here. If I have good efficient posture, if I'm in neutral, I can move very freely. If I'm in an upper cross pattern though, which is where most of us live, it shuts my joint space down. I physically cannot move freely anymore. Is there a difference? So we can stretch all we want. But can you stretch this away? Nope. You cannot. So we commonly see simple things like, all right, Grandma, come on over to our bed. Ooh. Career ended rotator cuff. 
How much does your moderator weigh? 18, 20, 25. I work with some services with extra battery packs shoved in one of the bags. You're looking at a 30 pound uh, dumbbell that you drag around with you on every call. Significant load? Yep, I call it a significant load. How do you pick it up? And you plop it on the stretcher. Repetitively, not a good thing to do. But not so much of a load that it should cause a catastrophic <coughs> injury, but it does because of the distortion where the muscles don't fire properly. When you have stuck in this upward cross pattern with proper posture, the bowling ball sitting on the toothpick, which is kind of the relationship to our cervical spine or our head, should weigh about 12 pounds. The problem is the average American one and a half to two inches forward head deviation. For every inch the head goes forward, double the weight of the bowling ball. Your poor cervical spine and the nerves that exit, nerves don't stretch real well, which we all kind of intuitively know, are a constant traction. So there's a myriad of other injuries that occur. Wrist, elbow, mid-back, and getting the low back problems. All because in head position, when we talk about overcoming difficult ergonomic situations, Rule number one, always look up. Your head is up. Neutral spine, even in a dangerous position, you've given your body a chance of not getting hurt. But most of the time, when we take load, because this feels normal, this is right where we go is we, at the moment that's the most dangerous. It's a training issue. We just have to talk to do it. Pattern number two, the most complicated because the muscles are bigger and the most expensive because it involves 